episode two, House of the Dragon. Oh. Are you enjoying it? I mean, what, what gets better than a Game of Thrones episode with bodies sort of slightly kind of moist, swollen, drowned bodies being eaten by crabs? I mean, of course, Nadia immediately, Nadia, by the way, who is watching this, but she said, bless her, she went off to bed. All I know is that people want power and I don't know who wants power. And I like the fact that I'm watching them want power. So she didn't feel she could really contribute in any meaningful way, but I'm sure she will in the morning or coffee morning. Um, anyway, suffice it to say, this started in grisly fashion and there wasn't a jot of sex in this episode. Is that a first? For Game of Thrones? Is that a first? Anyway, yeah, so uh, we had crabs eating people, a little reminiscent of Cornwall and spider crabs, ships going down and all the rest of it. It's very much the episode where Corlys Valerian comes to the fore. He becomes a sort of player. This is like an elaborate game of chess, isn't it? With all the kind of pieces on the on the chessboard sort of shifting and making the manoeuvres and what have you. We get a we get a sense in this episode of how Otto Hightower, Reese Evans, how he's sort of, you know, he's trying to get his position on the uh, chessboard, get, getting closer to power. I mean, he's, he's essentially the king's right-hand man, uh, Viserys' right-hand man, but he wants his daughter to potentially be uh, Viserys Sarah's right hand woman too. So um so Reese Siffens is is all to be watched there because Reese Siffens is is after his own games and you wonder, you know, what, what's gonna happen to him across it. For me, Reese Siffens is like uh, House of the Dragons equivalent to Alistair Campbell uh, in Tony Blair's court. So we had, we and also within this episode, there were a number of scenes in which we got to see the young Rhaenyra. Uh, Rhaenyra, who has played Millie Alcock, Nadia agreed, she's a cracking young actress. We are watching the birth of a sort of Anya Taylor-Joy-esque uh, talent here. She, she's both enigmatic to look at, but she's incredibly grounded. And within this kind of, the, and I think this is something to be said for all the performances in this, within the lunacy of fantasy, and this is where I think Lord of the Rings needs to watch itself. All of these actors are playing it very, very, very much for real. This could be a medieval drama set in Elizabethan England, you know, Elizabeth I, couldn't it? I mean, it has, you believe it, you buy into it. Okay, there are dragons, but that's almost like the only sort of extra detail that kind of drags you into a fictional landscape. This could be Britain circa 605, you know, AD. So in this episode, very much Rhaenyra, Millie Alcock's Rhaenyra, the young Rhaenyra is, you know, she's starting to flex her muscles. She's starting to prove her power uh, and, and illustrate that, you know, that there is power and there is nuance and there is strong decision making and there's strategy within a young girl's head. Um, Paddy Considine, I think, is doing an incredibly good job of playing a king who's unkinglike. I mean, Matt Smith refers to this at the end where he says something along the lines of, it's never been my brother's strong suit. And uh, uh, Corliss Valarian says, what, what is? And Matt Smith says, being a king has never really been his strong suit. And, and in a sense, Paddy Considine is really playing the most unkingly of kings. You know, he's much more interested in his sort of um, miniature train set, which is kind of his models and his kind of little figures of his dragon. I really relate to him, actually. He's just, just interested in his figures of his dragon. That when he dropped it, Otto Hightower's daughter goes off, fixes it and brings it back. He's like, oh, I remember you because you fixed my, my action figure. Um, and I like the way Considine's playing that, that. He's a real father. And I believe, having hated him for the Caesarean section scene uh, in episode one, I believe his regret. I believe his sadness and I believe his trauma. He had the most fantastic line. War was easier than daughters is the line that Sean Bean uttered in Game of Thrones, which I put in fact as a quote at the front of our book on homeschooling. The quote from this season so far about being a parent or a father to daughters is this, Paddy Considy. There are times when I would rather face the black dread himself than my daughter of 15. There endeth a, an incredibly meaningful monologue, even though it's not quite a monologue, it's a sentence. But wow, what a, what a truism, what a truism. Some, something else about this show that is just absolutely sensational is it blends and meshes CGI with authentic, real production design beautifully. Uh, I want to give a particular shout out to the scene with the real candles where Alicent Hightower, Otto Hightower's daughter, who's obviously uh, Otto uh, Reese is trying to inveigle her into the king's line of vision so that the king has a soft spot for her. Uh, she's talking to uh, Millie Alcock as uh, Rhaenyra and they're around these candles and that scene with the candles, A, real candles, B, real light. I mean, I don't know if they were really lit because they would have had to keep recast, but it looked so real. But the sound, go back to that scene and listen to the Atmos and the Atmos is the wild track, the the atmosphere, not the, not the audio of the voices, not the music, just the Atmos, rich, layered, granular. Christos, you'll know what I'm driving out there. 
Um, and there was a really, I thought it was a really poignant scene. It was a really powerful scene between two young women who have difficult relationships with their dads for very difficult, different reasons. I mean, Alison Hightower, obviously, because her father is trying to farm her out to the king, uh, and uh, Renera because she just wishes that the king saw her as more than just a little girl. And I thought that was really good. At one point, Nadia said, when they described the kind of state of the nation, there's a scene where Corlys Valerian, Corlys Valerian, the guy with the wonderful white dreads, as I say, he comes into centre stage here. He, he, as I understand it, he's the master of an enormous fleet, uh, but half the fleet is is in danger at the Stepstones, is it? Um, but of course he has great power, even with what remains of his fleet, so he's a vital ally to Paddy Considine's uh, Viserys. So, you know, Paddy Considine doesn't want to annoy him, but at the same time, he's thrown, he's thrown a bit of a bum steer here because Corlys Valerian suggests that Paddy Considine marries his daughter, but the problem here is, is that Valerian's daughter is 12, and what I was pleased about here was we were, we were nibbling back at the kind of the truths of medievalness the truths of what it would be like in this medieval era where you know a grown man would marry a 12 year old daughter uh, a 12 year old girl and eventually wait for her to give him offspring and so there's this pressure happening this pressure on the king by his by his court and by his by his realm for him to try again and have more children and of course this will present all sorts of problems for um Rhaenyra because of course if Paddy Constantine does have children with with someone else uh with uh, Corlys Valerian's daughter 12 year old daughter when she comes of age um then of course you know Rhaenyra doesn't get a look in she's she's out of the equation she's not going to be the next in line and of course don't forget Paddy Constantine's promised her it though I couldn't feel I was trying to struggle I was struggling to get a sense of whether Paddy Constantine had kind of regretted making that decision in this episode we had another illustration of um, King Viserys's illness. He's got his hand in a bowl of maggots. That was really gory. They're getting the maggots to eat the dead flesh. What has he got? Has he got leprosy? I'm beginning to think maybe he's got leprosy of some form. And as I say, Corlys Valerian has, has suggested to King Viserys that he marry and bring these two houses together. And of course, Corlys Valerian is married to Princess Rhaenys, is it? Princess Rhaenys, who actually was the direct uh, directly uh, the, the next in line to the throne. She was basically beaten, the character played by Eve Best, she was beaten by Paddy Considine, don't you remember? So in a sense, she has a more direct claim on the on the throne, on the Iron Throne, uh, much more direct than Paddy Constantine's Viserys does. So of course, uh, Princess Rhaenys, is it? And uh, Corlys Valerian, they're trying to get the king to marry their daughter. That would give them great power. It would unite two houses. It would put Princess Rhaenys uh, closer to the throne again. And there was a lovely scene between her and Rhaenyra where the young girl and her were, were sparring about, you know, what is the way and what should be the way and what is the lot of women. And this is as it should be. And this is what's right. And this isn't what's right. You know, and again, Rhaenyra was giving Rhaenys, Rhaenys a, a real run for her money. You know, Rhaenys, so a nice sort of antipathy being developed there. Conflict, conflict. And what's lovely about this, and what's so successful about this already is just within the confines of a family and the extended personnel of a family, all sorts of loyalties and enmities and hatreds and resentments and lies and all that kind of stuff are sort of brooding and building and, and moving along. And this episode didn't suffer for the fact that Matt Smith was only in it for a little bit. The King, Paddy Constantine, thank God he's got sort of morals. He, he's troubled with this. He doesn't want to marry a 12 year old. <laughs> That's the problem. He sort of makes the point to his court. But again, you know, the George R. R. Martin, this didn't shy away from suggesting it as a possibility and that's the brutalities of medieval life medieval weddings and all that kind of stuff Otto uh Reece Evans's daughter uh Alicent Alicent Hightower Alicent Hightower she wins over Paddy Constantine because she's mended his essentially she mends his action figure and gives him it in a box and that wins his heart but Constantine isn't sort of a prurient nasty sort of leery creepy kind of person no he's not he's, he's a bit more honourable than that but then it, it suddenly news emerges that Matt Smith had bloody he's a naughty boy isn't it Damon Targaryen Matt Smith has stolen an egg He's only gone and stolen a bunch of bloody dragon egg. It's at this point that you have to kind of p postpone and, and suspend belief because it does sound a bit ludicrous. But this, this is the Targaryen tradition, isn't it, of as a baby being in a crib with a dragon's egg alongside you and all that kind of stuff. So so Matt Smith felt like he wants an egg. It's not even that his second one. He wants a second wife too, who's a prostitute, is she? Um, and she's not even pregnant yet. But he wants the egg ahead of time. And so he's been over hasty and he's uncontrollable. He's hasty. He's, he, he makes rash decisions. He's, he's hot headed. He's hot headed is Matt Smith. But anyway, Matt Smith invites Paddy Constantine to his wedding. Paddy Constantine goes, no, I'm going to fight him. And instead, Reese Evans heads, heads along and they meet on the on the steps towards Dragonstone. Matt Smith has, has, has sort of, in a sense, taken over Dragonstone. He's basically squatting on Dragonstone with an egg. 
I mean, for God's sake. Reese Evans goes down um, and uh, he suggests that, uh, you know, that really, you know, it, well, it escalates pretty quickly, really. Reese Evans isn't very good at negotiating. Suddenly swords are all out. Matt Smith is holding an egg. Matt Smith is very angry. And who rides in on a fucking dragon? Rhaenerys. Rhaenerys, Rhaenyra rides in on a dragon. A little bit pokey, one moment there where she was holding on to it. There's always a bit, you remember Harry Potter when he was on a broom and it just looked awful in the first ones. There's always a bit of a moment, isn't there, where the movements of a dragon don't quite match the movement of whoever's on its back. Put that aside, she lands. She proves herself to be a great diplomat. She walks in, she almost, you know, she, she sort of invites her uncle, Matt Smith, to kill her. And it was at this point that Nadia said, today, you know, is there a romantic thing going on there? And I said, look, babe, you know, the Targaryens, they do this. They're a bit incestuous. They, yeah, there could be. Matt Smith maybe does fancy her. I don't know. Is that what's coming? Is that what we're going to look forward to later when Emma Darcy, the actress, takes on the more grown-up Rhaenyra? Um, so, so demon, demon Targaryen, he's kind of good. You get a bit of, you get a bit of his kind of argy-bargy, a bit of his sort of fastiness and all that kind of stuff. He draws his sword, he puts his sword, and then he throws the egg and he goes, oh, all right, sod it. Have it, have it your way. Head off. Reese Evans, though, Otto, he's a little bit shaken by the fact that Rhaenyra has kind of, you know, she's proved herself to be quite ham quite handy, quite handy in a crisis. Uh, and she can, you know, she can also command a dragon. So he's got to be careful, Reese Evans. I've got a feeling that Reese Evans is going to come to a grisly end at the hand or in the, in the flames of Rhaenyra's pet dragon. That's what I think is going to happen. There was quite a weird intimate scene between Matt Smith and his prostitute wife. Uh, but I thought she was, it was quite a powerful scene where she, her character normally would have been quite a disposable character, I think. And she talks about how actually she has an agenda hooking up with Matt Smith because she wants liberation. And so I thought, again, for gender politics, I thought that was quite meaningful that even you know once upon a time i think there's a time in game of thrones where perhaps a character such as a prostitute uh, would have just been dismissed the narrative arc of that character would have been dismissed but actually they built that one out a bit and i think that's quite a nice that's a nice storyline to have also uh, rumbling around inside matt smith's second or you know virtual concubine sort of wife situation so Paddy Considini asks for advice. Everyone thinks he's going to go one way. Is he going to go another? It's a bit like the Conservative voting. You know, could there be a shock surprise when she soon out wins? But no, we all think it's going to be Liz Truss. Well, we all think Paddy Considine, King Viserys, is going to have to marry. He's going to have to marry uh, the 12-year-old daughter of, of, of Corlys Valerian. But he, he comes to the court and he says, no, I'm not having any of it. I'm marrying, <gasps> God forbid, Otto Hightower's daughter, the girl who fixed his action figure. And of course, this breaks Rhaenyra's heart. Millie Alcock again played it beautifully. The the look, the because obviously these two are friends and they've bonded and they've they've connected over their relationships with their fathers and and now, but of course, alongside Alison Hightower, who Constantine is now going to marry, is Otto. Otto Reese Evans looking more and more Alistair Campbell esque as he sits there trying to kind of hide his glee and relish at the sudden change of fortune for his family line. Because, of course, if Paddy Constantine has a baby with his daughter, they are the most powerful. That, that's their next in line to the throne, no? Meanwhile, cut to our sort of penultimate scene or the ultimate scene, and it's Matt Smith having a sort of brandy, a pipe, and a, warming their socks in front of the fire with Corliss Valerian, and Corliss Valerian, clearly, he blows on cold hard. He, it was a high-risk game of poker when he challenged Viserys to marry his daughter, but now that Viserys has said no, Corliss Valerian has gone straight round the corner with his fabulously svelte-looking kind of blonde dreadlocks, and he's gone, Matt, Matt Smith, my fella, come on, if you support my troops and my navy and my, my warriors here... The rest of the nation and the realm will look to you as a leader who can prove himself, someone who can prove himself. So the gauntlet has been thrown to Matt Smith. Matt Smith is smelling the possibility of revolt. Could there be strength in numbers? So you can see how an army and a huge army at that is beginning to develop in opposition to King Viserys and by extension, uh, Rhaenyra herself. So um, so again, it's just shaping up again, all the pieces on the chessboard moving around rather beautifully. Uh, I love the way they call Corlys Valerian the sea snake. I wanted to call him the sea snake all the way through. Um, so there we go. That's where we're at. Are you enjoying it? And apparently episode two had even um, a higher overnight uh, viewing figures number than the first episode. So it's now, so House of the Dragon has broken the record it had already broken for the most watched show on HBO. Wow, it's doing well. 